Well, welcome everyone to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Thank you for joining us. We are starting the book of dun, 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 Revelation today, and yes. I am so excited about that. Um, it's such a famous book, such a, a book with so many different opinions, yeah. but a really gorgeous, hope-filled, good news-filled book. Yeah. Seth, how are you feeling? I feel like... I feel... Revelation is an intense book. Yeah. It's an intense book. Not only because I feel like I had intense opinions of it growing up oh, and sure. experienced it intensely, but also just the images of like beasts and meteors and seas be disappearing and evaporating and the sun falling like yeah. out of the sky. These are intense images. Right. And a lot of times they, they feel overwhelming. Mm. Uh, so, but... And so I kind of like started the study process for this feeling the weight of that and also just the weight of my own experience with the book of Revelation and a lot of our audience's views, uh, presumably, of the book yeah. of Revelation. Just feeling, okay, how can we do something helpful <laughs> in a book that has so much, uh, like, so much ink has been spilled and so many thoughts have been had about yeah, the book. That's true. So I'm feeling hopeful. Yeah. In my ability to be helpful. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. I think to, I've just you know you and you and um, our other staff writer Christine have really done the bulk of the research for this, and but just hearing y'all's conversations, you know, I'm just I've been so excited to have this talk with you because of how often you guys are just spilling good news instead of yeah. like conspiracy theories or something, <laughs> and it's just like uh, it's just been really cool. So we're gonna we're gonna have a talk today about. What is the book of Revelation? How to understand it? And hopefully by the end of it, you will even understand how to comprehend and interpret the number 666. That would be a great a good ending end goal landing for us. point uh, for this podcast. <laughs> yeah, we wanted to kind of stop and do a whole episode of just what's on the line? Like, what's the category of Revelation? How do we understand it? What's the genre? When was it written? Just to give us, put our heads on straight as yep. we get lost in the weeds of numbers and images and yeah. things like that. Okay. So, I mean, this might be a really big question or it could be, maybe, hopefully you've thought about this, but yeah. if you were going to have just a, let's start at the beginning yeah. conversation with somebody about Revelation, how do you even breach the topic? Like, what's a good place for us to begin on how to understand this book? I mean, nor I mean, like on a very practical level, I'd be like, "Well, what's your experience been with Revelation?" Oh, in the sure, past? yeah, that's <laughs> actually good. Um, you can tell you used to be a pastor. <laughs> that's a very pastoral. Yeah, because my experience, I, mean, I think this is similar to yours, was like I read all the Left Behind. Oh, books, I absolutely did. I loved and them. And I probably had a problem like differentiating the Left Behind series from actual scripture. scripture? <laughs> and so I was like, "No, there's going to be a new world order, and somewhere in the Carpathian Mountains, someone's going to rise up. That's right. and take over the world. Yes, and he's going to be." Crazy, <laughs> right? But um, I, I don't think that's exactly what Revelation's talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't agree with that necessarily. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, I don't. Left Behind are doing something good. They're yeah. representing a well-respected scholarly tradition. That's right. Uh, but I, at the end of the day, we probably will land somewhere different. Right. Um, yeah. Which is will be yeah. interesting regardless of where you fall on this yeah. spectrum. So, but yeah, I definitely was into the Left Behind. I mean, I remember like going to a Christian bookstore to get it like when like volume four yes. came out. I was like, it's on the shelf. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, I loved them. Yeah. yeah. And I think at the end of the day, like it, those books like sparked in me a deep desire to use my imagination when it came to scripture. Right. And it gave me a deep desire to take the words of scripture seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think they did it in this really like an apocalyptic way, which is yeah. revelation is an apocalypse, you know, but revelation means apocalypse. And so, like, it gave me, it just be important for me, like, formative mm. for me, even if I don't necessarily agree with those conclusions anymore. Totally. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, and I think what it did to me, though, you know, and probably yeah. what it did to a lot of people, and maybe I don't want to use Left Behind as the scapegoat. Mm -hmm. People have read Revelation this way for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and, but what, what, it, what I think the expectations I had coming into this book, you know, before studying it really deeply... Um, in Christian higher education <laughs> was like that it's all um, these very, very opaque, hard to understand like Omega codes that you have to crack in order to understand what's going to happen r like when Jesus comes back at the end of time. Yeah. So it's like all future, 
it's like right. it's all what's yeah. coming it's all fairly literal it's, yes but and, it's and, also yeah. bizarre right and it's like yeah. okay are the locusts real locusts are they yeah helicopters are they what right. is it and uh and so that's that was my understanding of revelation and then i understood then i came to find out that there's oh there's a whole giant yeah other way of reading this book yeah. that you know scholars uh, talk about and i think i was talking with uh, one of the pastors at right church about revelation and he was saying to me it's like it seems like there's a whole bunch of people in our generation at least who read the left behind series and had some sort of experience with it but largely felt fairly like overwhelmed burdened and fearful by yes. the, 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 what that presented terrifying and yeah. so a lot of churches have not talked about Revelation in a long time. But mm. if you look through church history, Revelation was like a common diet mm. for the people of God. Yeah. Uh, because it represented a real hope when uh, you are under threat. Yeah. Like the, the picture of Revelation pa paints is pretty stark. A world empire bent on destroying Christians. Yep. And that's been the experience of a lot of Christians for most of church history. Right. And so this book has been profoundly used throughout, like it's been used consistently yeah. throughout church history. We've had a weird experience in America where we think we've built a government system that protects us from persecution, mm. right? Yeah. And we have this really scary vision of it. Uh, but it also doesn't really fit necessarily with our experience every, in everyday life here mm. in the States. And so we kind of put it to the side and haven't ta taken it back up in like church consciousness. Right. Another while. another way to talk about that, like in maybe the protected Western church, um, Revelation has to sometimes we have to feel like it has to be read a different way because the the way of reading it as those who are being persecuted, those under the onslaught of the beast doesn't make apparent sense to us right yes. away and, and so, so like maybe like it's about something else right right it's like it's just it's just something yeah that's yeah right. okay well thanks pastor seth for <laughs> checking in on me and how i used to feel about revelation what's the next step well i would honestly just read the first three verses okay. of the book of revelation because revelation thankfully tells us exactly what it is in the first three verses hallelujah uh so the, the, very, the very opening verse says the revelation of jesus christ so that word of revelation is the word apocalypse. Okay. Uh, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which God gave uh, him uh, to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Mm -hmm. And depending on your translation, the next phrase is, he made it known or he signified this by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written, for the time is near. Okay. So we kind of got four pieces of information there. Yeah, let's talk We've about it. we got, uh, this is an apocalypse. Okay. This is happening soon. Okay. This is a signifying document. Um, so that phrase, made it known, is the word... It signifies, it was signified to John. That's a really loaded biblical word, okay. the word signified. And it is also a prophecy. Okay. So, so those are the four things that Revelation tells us up front. Before you read it, you should know this is an apocalypse. I'm talking about something that's happening soon. Uh, it is a symbolic document. It signifies things. Okay. And uh, it's a prophecy. All right. So we should talk about those four categories. We, we definitely should. Okay. <laughs> Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Talk to me about that word because when I think the I think the common use of that word means end of the world. Yeah. Right? That's right. Is that what it means? It means revelation. Right. It means <laughs> unveiling. It means revealing. Yeah. And we have and so that's what it means. Yeah. I, I just looked it up in my like uh Greek Bible dictionary here. Yeah. And it like it's just like like taking the cover off. Yeah, like something was covered and veiled. You, you apocalypse it. You apocalypse it. You, right. You unhide it. That's right. Yeah. And we are familiar with that term from like apocalyptic movies, ap apocalyptic literature. And you can think those are fair representations of what an apocalypse is supposed to invoke. When the zombie apocalypse comes, it reveals who we really are down. Are we really just animals? Oh. Are we just monsters haunted by a disease trying to survive? Mm. Like... Uh, when global warming takes over and it's the day after tomorrow, isn't this the unveiling of our human pride? Mm. Uh, like, this is what our apocalyptic genres still do today. 
I have never thought about it like that. Uh, <laughs> I just thought it was like, look at all the crazy special effects. <laughs> right, but it's normally an unveiling of some a problem within humanity. I really need to think deeper when I'm watching disaster <laughs> movies. <laughs> Seth's over here analyzing the human psyche, and I'm like, whoa, that zombie almost that's bit a, that girl. That's an amazing special <laughs> effect. <laughs> that's actually really helpful. Okay, yeah. so it's a book. Revelation is a book that reveals something. It reveals something. It, yes. It, there's something hidden. And it takes yes. the 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 hiding thing away, so we can yeah. see it as it truly is. And just to keep with our apocalyptic movie genre, it like it also is an unveiling of the world as we know it, mm-hmm. and normally the description of the end of the world as we know it as well, right? Reve- like an apocalypse is the ending of a world mm. uh, as as it once was conceived, and it's the survivors trying to figure out a new world order. And so there is a sense that within at least the book of Revelation, perhaps not apocalyptic literature as John understood, because that's another category here, mm-hmm. is that's but that's something to be preserved. Like there is within the apocalyptic imagination an ending of one world order and the beginning of a new. Mm. And it's the unveiling of things as they are now as we transition into a new world order. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That uh end of the world doesn't necessarily have to mean everyone's dead that's right or the planet blows up that's right or everything's flooded it could mean a transfer of power the world as we know it has changed that's right uh and china takes over america that's right that would be an apocalyptic event for america mm-hmm. if china took over yeah okay and in in in, in like in just to stay with the movies like we reveal human pride uh-huh. that caused the zombie apocalypse right and something new has taken its place, yes. right? And that's right. that's what an apocalypse does. I what see. takes the place of the old world order once it has been revealed for what it truly is. Okay. And I think that's what Revelation is doing in many ways. Yeah. Um, but to move away from like our understanding of the word apocalypse yes. and what it is revealing, there's a whole category of ancient literature called apocalyptic literature right. that was really common in the day that... Uh, John was writing absolutely in a similar way that apocalyptic movies are so familiar right. to us. Yep, there's we, a genre. There's it's a like, genre. Yeah, at you're, play. when you go see an apocalyptic movie, something has something bad is going to happen. That's right. Yeah, and it's like if you if you're like this is an apocalyptic movie, you go to it, and it's like a romantic comedy. You're like this was the wrong genre. Right. There are expectations. That's right. Inside of that genre. So talk to me a little bit because you, I know you. This is your area of expertise for the moment. <laughs> oh, <laughs> is like. What when we when a first century reader would yeah. have read the word apocalypse, what would they have been expecting rather than what we expect when we hear the word apocalypse? Yeah, sure. Uh, I I found this one definition to be really helpful. Uh, I found it in the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary. So there was this uh, group of scholars headed up by this other uh, theologian named J.J. Collins. And they did this deep study of all apocalyptic literature, some of which is in like pottery fragments, but some of which are like you know, full scrolls, scrolls. yeah, Yeah. Uh, from 250 BC to 250 AD, which was the heyday of this kind of literature. It's a 500-year period where the bulk of apocalyptic literature... Can't imagine any type of literature surviving for 500 years. It's so true. I mean, but I mean, this is some... I mean, mean, this, this. This is some really good... uh, Yes. But I mean, even as a genre, though, I mean, is like... If you're going to survive a genre, let Rep- this one survive because yeah. this is fun. This is super yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. anyway, so they they compiled this definition for an apocalypse. Okay. So apocalypse is a genre of revelatory literature with a narrative framework. So I'll stop okay. there because I think those two are really helpful. So it's revelatory. We've talked about that. It's, reveal something it's reveal something. Hiding something that was hidden is now being revealed. Yep. But it's not like, let me... It's not like an epistle where it's, hey, you think it's this, but it's actually this. It's built on a narrative framework. It's going to tell you a story. Okay. And so you, it, if, if you find yourself interpreting a piece of apocalypse and you aren't following any kind of narrative, mm-hmm. you're missing something. The uh, Another way to say that is like there's a reason why in the book of Revelation 7 – bowls or follow seven trumpets and right. those details are connected to one another they're not just random metaphors used by the author that's right okay yep so it's following a narrative framework so it's a revelatory literature inside a narrative framework in which a revelation so you know some kind of revealing is mediated 
by an otherworldly being and a human recipient. Okay. So you've got this big amount of revelation that has to happen and there's a mediation that occurs. Yeah. And it's between a human recipient and some kind of divine being. And in throughout the book of Revelation, that's exactly what happens. There's something that happens in the heavens. An angel delivers that message to John. Right. John is then recording it for us. And the revealer is Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega. Yes. He's the one doing the ultimate revealing. Uh, and what they what they reveal, they disclose a transcendent reality. So you guys are living in this one world order, but I'm seeing something different. There's a transcendent reality. There's something bigger going on, mm -hmm. uh, and it has two sides to it. It's both temporal and it's also supernatural. So it's temporal in that it talks about eschatological salvation for the people who are living on the earth. Meaning like real time. People right now alive. Need saving. Need yep, saving. That's right. Okay. And so it's like like what you said. It's, yeah. it's coming soon. It's coming soon. Yes, you yes, need yes. salvation. And you're stuck in a world order. There are things happening. You need some kind of transcendent revelation to show you that everything is going to be okay. It's kind of almost like when he, uh, when John says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ that must soon take place. We're like, yeah, yeah, we know that. Right. People would be like, of course it is. Of course it is. That's what this genre does. I understand. Exactly. So it's like, good. This is, so this is, it's a, it's a message of salvation okay. to people in need. <laughs> Got it. That's what it is. Uh, but it's also um, like supernatural uh, or like, it's not just spatial in the temporal world. Mm -hmm. It's also supernatural in that it, it, it always involves, this genre always involves a seeing or an encounter of a transcendent world. Right. So you're not just, it's not just like, oh, hey, you see that problem here on earth? Mm. Let me show you what's really going on. You're okay. Yeah. It's going to happen because the, the mediation and the revelation is happening inside of a transcendent yes. spiritual world. And you're going to get a glimpse into that world. So what's fascinating, it just kind of sounds like I'm breaking down the elements of Revelation. <laughs> right. But I'm not. I'm actually describing a whole genre of which all this 500 years of literature yeah. that this team right. of scholars researched, they all have these characteristics. Got it. So he's using mm -hmm. all of these standard I don't want to call them tropes, but that's what they are. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're he's, just he's operating within the genre. Right. If you had a romantic comedy without a meat cute, you'd be breaking the genre. Yeah. And so And if you are breaking the genre, maybe intentionally. Intentionally. So. Right, right, exactly. You're subverting it. But the but the book of Revelation accords very well with this body of literature that existed for 500 years. So what do you sh so based off this conversation of apocalyptic literature, if you're opening up this book and you're reading it, what you should expect then is an unveiling of the world as it is in the beginning of a world, a new world order. Yes. Uh, in conversation with spiritual realities behind current physical realities as it relates to me, a man who needs saving. That's right. And and, <laughs> and like the one thing I want to highlight, it, it, which was the most surprising thing when you asked me to look at like what what does what do what do scholars say about the body of wider apocalyptic literature? Yeah, the one function that they say it it does is hope. Fast, not just revelation, of course revelation, yeah. but of the the genre of apocalyptic literature mm. is hope. It's not prediction. It's not you know uh, right, right, right. E even like it's not even unveiling. Yeah, as yeah, the yeah. core function, the use of it is hope. Fascinating. Whereas, whereas our apocalyptic genre today might be um, to humble people. That's right. To expose, to humiliate. Yeah, or even just to yeah. I've watched some very sad movies. Like, oh, this is hopeless. Like, right. Hopelessness. Hopeless. Might Hopelessness. Be the yeah. Yeah. But the point of all apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature and Revelation is par excellence. Mm -hmm. Is it is a book of hope. Mm. So if we at any point start going down a road that's not leading to hope, we're reading it wrong. <laughs> right. So if you get the end of the book, the end of the book of Revelation, and you're not hopeful, right. For it's <laughs> you, like you, you might missed something, you might have missed something, yeah. <laughs> which is the exact opposite feeling we talked about, kind of like that. I think we felt when yeah. sometimes reading, uh, like the Left Behind series or something. Right. I just felt hopeless. I felt afraid. Yeah. I felt like there was this coming thing that I couldn't avoid, and I really wanted to. And it's like, no, it's actually a book of hope. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think maybe even more granularly, it's like I think you could look at the Left Behind series of 12 books and say, well, it ends in hope. But the seven, the scorpions oh, coming right. out of the earth right. are not hopeful. Right. Um, I think I would probably take that like hope, like her, the hermeneutic of hope that mm. we should have in the book of Revelation to yeah. apply to almost every part of it. Like every part of it 
is meant to communicate hope to people. Yeah. Uh, so as we've been studying this, like there's no part of this that is just pure judgment. Yeah. That's and if it is judgment, it is meant to invoke hope for those who trust in right. Jesus. So yeah. if you read even a section of Revelation without the hope of what Jesus can accomplish, we're reading it wrong. Yeah. And I think a lot of this comes out of the question, um, where did the apocalyptic genre come from? Okay. Um, so there's there's been lots of schools of thought around this. Uh, but the prevailing idea right now among scholars is actually an older idea. So all the new ideas that people came up with in like the 20th century have Lord. been debunked. And when you go back to the 1800s, an older idea. Um, and it's that it's not that uh, Jewish apocalyptic literature was borrowed from another society. That's actually been debunked. Okay. Uh, it's not that Jewish apocalyptic literature uh, came out of like an, uh, like an evolution of the prophetic genre. Because you could right. see that natural yeah. evolution. It's like yeah, you yeah. read some prophecies and you're like, I mean, it kind of has some weird poetic symbolic mm -hmm. language, mm -hmm. but their elements are completely different. Yep. And so what what the prevailing theory right now is that apocalyptic literature actually came out of the wisdom tradition of Israel. Okay. So like Proverbs, like the book of Proverbs. Uh, and that is based in an ordered, a wise ordered universe mm -hmm. that the, the world is built in a deterministic way. So there's a right way to live in the world. That's right. And when you live in the world in that right way, things go well. Yes. And when you don't live in the world that right way, things go horribly. That's right. And it's revealing that that truth. Yes, and yeah. that's it. It's yes. revealing the wisdom of God underneath the chaos of the world or the the things of the world that seem to break right. the, the, the wise way God's ordered the world. And the Jewish um, wisdom literature does that arguing yeah. in our own Bibles. Yeah. Like, you know, Ecclesiastes takes one stance and is like, you know, what happens when you follow all the good things that God said to do? Eh, it's all, yeah. it's all meaningless. And then, and Job is like, well, what happens whenever you're a righteous man? You suffer. I was like, yeah. wait, wait, but Proverbs said that if you are wise, you'll be blessed. So what's, what's happening? happening? And it's trying to reveal that mystery. Fascinating. And so you can see that progression less from a artistic side, like how the words are written and how the story's collected, and more from a theological, philosophical side of how do we have this conversation in, in a narrative way, in, in a cosmological way? Yeah. And that's maybe where the apocalyptic genre came from, is having these ideas of God's wise and determined order of the world and his ultimate victory mm -hmm. over the chaos and the contradictions. Right. Wisdom wins. Yeah. Anyway. It's interesting. I keep drawing parallels to like modern day apocalyptic literature, uh, mo apocalyptic movies, but this is a feature of modern movies too, mm. because... There's a wisdom in acknowledging human limits. And right. when humans start experimenting on apes, our, right. cre our creations will rise up and destroy us. Planet of the Apes. The planet of, it is a whole, like, 12 movies of it, <laughs> of like, of when we break the way the world is supposed to work. Yeah. When humans don't act like humans, mm. the world devolves. That's right. Um, when we're unwise. We're unwise. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So... Okay, so that's the first word. That is apocalypse. Uh, what's the second one? Uh, the second one we said we've started to address already that must soon take place. Okay. And so this could maybe get into like the dating conversation okay. uh, yeah. or even like how we're supposed to read it, but let's maybe bring it down. Okay. When the Bible says soon, mm. what does the Bible mean? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean soon as God means soon. And right. since God's an eternal being, soon could be a million years. To him could, a day is like a thousand uh, years, right. and a thousand years is like a day. Soon's relative. Or is this written to human beings who have normally an expectation of what soon might mean? Right. Uh, so that's kind of the, the first layer yeah. layered question here. Right. Do you have off the cuff like responses to that i mean i think that there, okay i'm just gonna just i'm gonna repeat what my rabbi taught me jesus jesus i didn't know if you had another rabbi i sure <laughs> hope i don't I, well i mean like just like a fred <laughs> rabbi like. i got one rabbi uh, uh and you know he's like you know i'm i'm coming soon yes you know and it seemed that that means two things it seems that when people wanted to be like, okay, so like, what's it, you know, how, how soon, what are going to be the signs that you're coming? And he's like, just be ready. That these are things that are happening soon. That phrase, I'm guessing, should create some kind of immediacy and expectancy in order not necessarily to determine when the events are going to occur, 
but more about the state of the reader's heart that they should have about what's about to be said. That's kind of like what Jesus did. Yes. Uh, uh, and then the other side of things is, I mean, Jesus, you know, t- tended to phrase things and his disciples tended to assume yeah. things were going to happen soon. Yeah. And the, they did not. So it also yeah. has to mean or has to have the range of meaning to things that right. will happen in the future. Yeah. The but very end of the book of Revelation says, behold, I'm coming soon. Oh, so it begins and ends the same way. It begins and ends the same way. Interesting. Uh, so again, so we've just said, okay, well, Jesus seemed to mean it kind of the same way. He meant, behold, I'm coming soon in like the second coming sense. He's coming yep, soon. Right. Like, and that hasn't happened 2000 years on. Yep. A lot of biblical interpreters say, no, no, Jesus did mean he was coming soon. And that happened when... Oh, Pentecost. Pentecost came. Yeah. Or that happened when the temple was destroyed. Yep, because that's the prophecies he gives right after saying that. Right. And Matthew 24, where he, like, predicts the fall of the temple, is a lot of that imagery is still here in Revelation. That's right. So it could be that it's within that time frame. Mm -hmm. Um, Let me just... It's kind of hard to talk about this within generality. So let me just say something really starkly. Okay. I think when we read this, we should read it from the human perspective first. Uh, like from, what do you mean human? Like my As perspective? my perspective of what soon is. Oh, um, oh, I understand. Of, of soon, not the book of Revelation. Not the book when of When we soon. read the word soon. When we read this word soon. We like, should think like This soon. is an apocalypse meant to, meant to give you hope, hope and salvation. Right. And behold, these things will soon take place mm. that give you hope. Yeah. And I think for me, that feels like one of the most compelling readings of Revelation is when we take these things as uh, things that are happening in the near future for the readers of Revelation. Mm. I think it's easy to get lost in all the crazy imagery that is used, but the first three chapters are all written to people in real life churches. Right. And then chapters four and five is not a vision of, uh, chapters four and five are not visions of the future, but visions of Jesus rising to his throne right after his death. Oh, right. So the first five chapters, the first 20% of the are book... Are happening, like, right now. Are happening right now or recently in the past. Yeah. So I, th- I think, and just to show my card before we get into mm-hmm. everything else, I think we should read soon, really as happening soon in yeah. our perspective and, of things. And happening soon from the original reader's standpoint. That's right. That's yeah. right. Like 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago soon. Yeah. I think a lot of what's being talked about in Revelation has already happened right. in some ways. Yeah. And I think a lot of it will still happen. Right. But that's part of the tug the tug of Revelation. And it's also a feature of prophecy, mm-hmm. which is what he also describes his book as. Okay. Right? Oh, yeah, because prophecy mm-hmm. was was always had that dual element, but most of it actually, if you read Isaiah, Old Testament prophecy, Jeremiah, Hosea, they're talking Amos. about things that are going on right now. That's right. And they're doing a revealing. They're mm-hmm. like, oh, you, you think that the Assyrians are coming because they're big and bad and mean. They're really coming right now because of your sin. That's right. Yeah. And then also, yeah, they will also talk about things that will happen. But that's actually more rare than, yeah. pro- than pr- prophecy talking about what's happening right now and showing God's perspective of current human events. That's right. Most of Hebrew prophets that you can read right now in your Bible is prophets describing the consequences for failing to live up to God's law yeah. in their real world political situations, mm-hmm. normally addressing kings and nations, right? right. Like that's what prophecy is doing. Yeah. And so when they get these crazy announcements, these crazy visions, these visions point to specific human kings, mm. specific human figures that would have been alive at the time of the writing of the prophecy. And frequently, frequently those visions of current realities get doubled Mm. or telescoped or repeated or fulfilled by Jesus later. So, right? Right. So it's like Isaiah has a prophecy of this king who will come called the Prince of Peace. Right. Right. And he was referring to a real person yes. in his time. Yep. And he and this is the same king that fulfills the virgin birth. That's right. Prophecy were, that Matthew says is fulfilled in Jesus. That's right. That's the telescoping you're talking that's about. That's exactly right. Yes, the prophet is saying this is happening right now and it's going to happen with this king. Yep. But he's all, but that doesn't mean that that can't mean that Jesus fulfills it in a greater or telescoped way in the future. That's right. Okay. And a lot in there and part of prophecy isn't just a theological interpretation of current events that sometimes accidentally or intentionally reflect 
the second coming of Jesus mm-hmm. or tell us a future reality. Sometimes they just tell us straight up future things. Right. Right. And they just say things that are going to happen in the future yep. without qualification. So many times throughout Isaiah, you'll hear, and the nations will stream back into Zion. Yes. It's like, well, that's not, that's not happening right now. In Zechariah, says, one day God will protect Jerusalem with a wall, wall of, of fire, fire and nobody will be able to assail her yet again. I'm like, okay. Okay. Has that, that happened? That, has that happened yet? <laughs> um, uh, so I, I say that because that also helps understand what, what soon means. Yeah. Prophecy, as the Old Testament understands prophecy, always had a real world referent generally before it had a future reference. Mm-hmm. And so I think as we approach Revelation, we should we should uh, cheat or we should lean to reading it historically. Right. Before the pe- we, for the people who needed the hope in that moment. Right. Yeah. How, how would they understand it? Until we jump to right. the, what, well, what could it mean in the future? Yeah. So. Okay. So then I've got a, uh, we got one more word we, we haven't talked more. about. That's and right. It was the third one. And, and I, I had trouble finding it. What, yeah. What was so the word? in your, it depends on your translation. Okay. But if you read verse one, it says, <laughs> Oh, that's why it's hard to find. <laughs> it's it's a, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known. Oh, made it known. That phrase, made it known. Okay. I'm reading from the ESV. I think the NIV has the same. Uh, the new King James might have that, but the old King James has signify. You have a range of different ways of reading this word, but it's a very rare word. Mm. Um, uh, you uh, The author could have used the word, the, the Greek word is somino. Yeah. Um, he could have used a whole bunch of other name words to, connotate knowing something that wasn't been known before but this specific greek word is actually used uh in the book of daniel uh oh in the septuagint in the septuagint and it is used to understand uh the vision that the dream that king nebuchadnezzar has of this four-parted statue Mm. and in fact the whole of this opening line right here is copied from daniel chapter 2 it follows the same structure. Oh, so the the John, the author of Revelation, is using the structure of a verse from Revelation, uh, Daniel chapter two, to talk about his new uh, work that he's working on, and using the same language that Daniel is using right before he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream of this giant four-parted statue. Right. Um, so, which we're gonna see Jesus as. We'll see Jesus as a yeah. statue here <laughs> right. in just a second. Yeah. So here, so why is that significant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because well, that tells us that word signify is that we are dealing primarily with symbols, mm. not primarily with literal objects. Yes. A, a way to maybe help clarify that yeah. is John's own writing in the gospel. He actually... Uh, uses this word the most out of any biblical author. He does. And I'm just doing a quick word scrub. He uses it three times in his gospel. And each time is, and Jesus said this to show. That's right. To, what was the word you used? Signify. Signify. Uh, what kind of death he was going to die. Yeah. So whenever he says, tear this temple down and I'll rebuild it in three days. Mm-hmm. He, everyone's like, you can't do that. Like they took it literally. That's right. And he's like, no, I'm saying this to signify something else. It's That's a right. symbol. Of what? Of my death and resurrection. Yes. And so, like, that's a really clear picture mm-hmm. of Jesus said, I'm going to tear down the temple and raise it up again. He didn't mean that. L- I mean, I guess that also does happen. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's doing that to signify something else. Yeah. Okay, so it's, you're saying we need to treat things that's right. in Revelation as symbols. And so what happened in the Daniel story? Mm-hmm. Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of a giant statue made of four different types of metals that was struck down by a giant mountain, comet mountain, that mm-hmm. grew to fill the earth. And what's the interpretation of that? These four metals represent four kingdoms. kingdoms. And that, and they're eventually all struck down by another kingdom coming. Right. And so it was very clear to Daniel and to Nebuchadnezzar after Daniel interpreted it, that his vision of some sort of strange otherworldly reality was a symbol of something happening in the real in real life future. Right. So one way to say it is, 
I think most of us come to the Bible or many of us come to the Bible with a desire to read it literally first yeah. and only symbolically when we need to. Mm. But the book of Revelation actually invites us to do the opposite. We should read it symbolically first and only liter- literally when we need to. Right. And the symbols are John's chosen mean to communicate to us and to treat them as literal things would be to mess with John's intention for the yes. letter. Does that make that makes I, sense? Am I making myself clear? I think you're making a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Whenever we read, uh, are there locusts in Revelation? I think there, there are locusts are. Okay. in Revelation. So when we read locusts, the wrong impulse that John that John doesn't want to invite us into is to be like, okay, so insects are coming. Right. That's right. At this time, or because of this action, so there's going to be a time when there's going to be a lot of insects. Right. Maybe. The, maybe. But the, but that would be the second thing that we need to do. What we need to say is, okay, that m- is probably a symbol. What could that symbol mean based on all the other contexts, everything else he's trying to communicate to me, and That's then right. get to what it means instead of like, okay, it's, it's locus. That's right. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. That's what he's inviting us into. That's right. Okay. And then before we move on, yep. let's talk about one other like thing that's one other really thing. important about the book of Revelation. Okay. It is is full of so much Old Testament. Oh, yeah. I think something like 407 allusions. Are you serious? Uh, and there's only like 200 something verses. That's um, incredible. Uh, um, so John is painting with the palette of the Old Testament. That I like that phrase. Uh, I think I stole it from somewhere. Oh, that's good. I mean, that would be, that's good. <laughs> uh, it's probably Peter Lightheart. Oh, uh, Lightheart. Painting with it. the palette of the Old Testament to encourage his current audience. And so when we get to a symbol we don't understand, mm-hmm. our gut reaction is to take it literally because that's makes sense to us. Okay, the I trust the Bible, God right. is a lie. Yes. So it's got to be locus. Right. Or we see that thing and we start thinking, well, miss, maybe it's referencing something in my future reality. Right. Or something I'm experiencing currently. Maybe the locusts are helicopters. Maybe the locusts are this false teaching I'm experiencing uh-huh. in my church. Right. Maybe they're the false prayers of the Church of Satan. I don't know. Maybe they they are a referent to something I experience. But because Revelation is so full of Old Testament imagery, the first place you should run where you meet a symbol you don't understand is actually backwards. So good. To read the rest to read the rest of your Bible because that's the colors that's, that he's painting with. That's exactly right. That's so helpful. Um, so that's that that's our should be our impulse when we okay. like. I don't quite get this. Well, how was it used mm. in the Old Testament right. when he's riffing on Zechariah? Yep. What does Zechariah? What is he talking have about? Have in mind when he has horses, right? Because he's doing that on purpose. He's doing that on purpose. That's right. That's really really helpful. And I think you're right. I think my impulse when I run up against something in a book like this, or even just when I'm reading the New Testament. Because you know this is this is not unique to Revelation. Maybe That's the right. density of the allusions, yeah, 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 yeah. But like that is a great just. Let's just stop for a second and just give this <laughs> yeah. as a PSA to us all as Bible students. Is when we're seeing something in the New Testament we don't understand. Is there an Old Testament thing that the author's pulling on? That's where you got to run first. That's right. Let's. Do I get to say my favorite my favorite nerd phrase? Please. It's called the hermeneutical spiral. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. It's the idea of letting the Bible interpret itself. Yeah. Instead right. of going outside of the Bible for interpretation, does the Bible provide a tighter coil of interpretation to get down to what it means? Yeah. First. Yeah. So I just love that. Okay. So we've we finally made it through the first three verses. <laughs> right. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> What's next? Well, I think it would probably just be helpful to kind of give a brief overview of the ways people read the book of Revelation. Okay. And then kind of just say, hey, here's where we land at the outset. All right. Sure. Um, so um, if you're familiar with the book of Revelation and scholarship around the, the book of Revelation, you probably are aware there's two primary camps that mm. people fall into when they read the book of Revelation. The first is a um, functionally a historical understanding of the book and kind of what we've been hinting at so far, that these accord and these are talking about historic realities right now in the past or in the future things that are actually going to happen 
in real time in, real time. in some way. So when you mean history, you don't you don't mean past. It could be past. It could be past. Uh -huh. It could be our current reality or it could be future. So okay. let me give you some examples. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and these all have different names, but I'm simplifying for the sake of this podcast. Right. But there's a, a, ver a variety of interpretations that read Revelation as the description of some era of human history. Oh, that's helpful. Uh, one uh, that I find particularly compelling is reading the book of Revelation as a description of the events leading up to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Right. And these A, a D D A D 7 70. So there were letters and then numbers. What did I say? No, you said it absolutely right. It just some I always think that phrase is funny cuz it sounds 70? like you're saying 8070 like 80, the 8070 oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's in AD the, in, in the Anis year of our Lord Annus Domini uh 70 <laughs> <in> Latin. <laughs> um, uh, uh so some sort of historical route. Yeah. I find that view particularly compelling. Other people throughout history have read Revelation as a reference to a particular period of time that they were experiencing. So like many reformers thought it was a reference. Uh, Book of Revelation was talking about the rise and fall of the Catholic Church. Right. Uh, it's been interpreted uh, or so like some historical reference. Right. And people have done that throughout time. And we yep. do that same thing where we read it in kind of like a Left Behind series. Right. This is speaking to us today, and the details of the book of Revelation, if you understand them correctly, reveal what's about to happen. What's about to happen in our world as we know it, with helicopters and nuclear weapons and democracies and dictatorships. That's what it's talking about. Right. The other way to read it is primarily in the far, far, far future that has no reference to where we are right now. Oh, so this is not the historical. It is in the sense of oh, like okay. it is a future reality describing real events. And normally with this futurism uh -huh. is a literalism, generally. Okay. So things that, that are so fantastic that I can't you can't even map them on right. current events. Right. Okay. In the future, God will send chariots that look like locusts, that oh, look like okay, okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. with the hair of uh, with the hair of women. <laughs> like I got you. that's what yeah. And so that's one way to read it historically. Right. To honor the the images yeah. in a literal way yeah. is to say that's way going to happen in the future. Gotcha. In a real historical sense. Okay. That's helpful. Okay. Yep. So this is a historic. That's the one camp of historic. Yes. These are going to play out on the human stage in some era of human history. Yes. Boom. And sometimes that's like all past, some future. Some it's like, oh, it's on our doorstep. Here's where everything ties. And some's like locusts from heaven are coming that's right okay cool. that's right that's the historical understanding of the book of revelation yep with all kinds of stripes of interpretation yes Maybe. from varying from symbolic to literal okay. to whatever so what's the other one the other one is generally called like the recapitulation recapitulationist Re view or the idealist view idealist. or the patterned view okay and its view of revelation is that revelation is not meant to address any particular period in human history but all eras and so, of human history. Yeah, and, and since it does address all eras of human history as this recapitulated pattern, oh, you might be like, oh, that's why it, it, you think it's that. Because right. it maps on to how human history always right. goes. And that's, that's why it's easy to map on to the temple. It's easy to map on to the fall of the Catholic Church. It's easy to map... That's right. Because it's always happening. That's right. Okay. And so and there's evidence for that within right. Revelation. Revelation is structured as a repeating set of sevens. Yep. Um, and it seems like the same event happens three times. The world seems to end three different times right. or four different times yeah, uh, uh, end, yeah. uh, within the book of Revelation. Right. So how do you make sense of the total collapse of the cosmos at the end of every other, every fourth chapter? <laughs> right. Well, maybe it's intending to show you the pattern of history. Yes. Powers fall, uh, powers rise, and yep. then powers fall. Uh, Christians are persecuted, but then Christians are raised up to eternal life in Jesus. Yes. One of my favorite theologians who's written on this, he describes it as watching a football game. Yes. And it's the same game. Okay. Okay. But let's say at one time you watched it and you were a coach on the field. That's and then right. another time you watched it and you were up in the stands. And another time you watched it, you're in the Goodyear blimp above the above it. And you're yes. going to see different things each time. It's going to look a little different. That's right. But you're watching the same game three times. That's right. So that's how he's described and it. And so that's another way to take the book of Revelation. Right. So at the end of the day, where I've landed on this for now is that I can't decide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, because I think both views present problems. Yep. And they also both have a ton of merit and helpful ways right. of helping us understand the book. The two places I lean most are this is description of reality leading up to the fall of, of Jerusalem yep. in the year of our Lord. <laughs> 70. 70. Uh, um, 
and the idealist position, which says that this is like showing us a pattern of how world powers will rise and fall, persecute Christians, and God will ultimately preserve his church. Right. Okay. So let me say that again, because I think I'm hearing you. So where you're kind of ambiguously leaning right now is that Revelation describes the uh, events that are going to happen or have happened or whatever, that, that kind of point we haven't made yet. But the events leading up to the destruction of the temple in the year 70 mm-hmm. and that type of um, event, those types of world events and what mm-hmm. occurs in them recapitulate again and again through history, showing us a norm yeah. for how the world operates and how God responds. Right. And I think that accords with the prophetic nature of the book. Right. Right. It's like this is descript- John is a prophet yeah. describing world realities calling people to action yeah and that those prophecies of his current era and things that were soon to take place in his current era then act as patterns for christ to fulfill later on yes the same way the virgin birth in isaiah's day was true of a character in his life so too uh of jesus the same thing is happening in the book of revelation Yep. And I mean, there's a whole, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch there that we could continue to talk about. Right. Um, Before we move on from yeah. that though, I do want to land the plane. Cause I think some people might be like, cool. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's, let's explore it. And then I think other people might be like destruction of the temple. Oh uh, yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think like there are, there are a few things that might be helpful great. to talk about there. Um, because I think for people so far removed, maybe from, you know, the old Testament reading of scripture, from Israel, from you know, it, it can be easy to forget about the temple, <laughs> you yes. know, and then even then, it can be really easy to not understand the importance of it, especially yeah. to a first century Jewish person, right? Uh, and so, uh, two things to note there one, when Jesus talked about the destruction of the temple, which he explicitly talked about many, many times, yeah, he used this kind of apocalyptic language to talk about it. He did the falling of skies, the falling of stars from heaven. Yeah. He, yeah, the, he, yeah. And so like those two things, Revelation and yeah. how Jesus talked about the destruction of the temple, they just go hand in glove. So it yeah. makes sense to read them as uh, referring to the same yeah. thing. Yeah. In Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus has a long extended conversation with his disciples about when yep. the temple was going to be destroyed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he talks about wars and rumors of wars, and famines, yep. and earthquakes. The and moon turning, the, or the sun turning to blood or something. Some, and yeah. he says all these things are going to happen before this generation passes away. Right. And, and it did. And it, and it did. In the and year so 70. I think a, in a lot of ways, Revelation is kind of picking up where Jesus left off yep. and filling in the rest of that prophecy. Here is in more detail what our savior said would happen right until that that day that that day that day comes That's and right. to answer your question like well why is that important why mm-hmm. would that like why would the destruction of the temple warrant an entire book of the bible right why would it be such a, a facet of jesus's own ministry right. that he's condemning that thing and why do we have a whole book potentially, potentially. dating yep. it at that time right. describing that event um i think the best way to just summarize it is that the world is a temple from the Garden of Eden. This was my other point. Uh, so, yes. this, like God has intended humanity to live with him in a space. Um, and it was intended to be the whole world. The whole right. world. That was, was what the garden was for. The whole world was supposed to be a temple. Yeah. Um, when humanity refused to uh, cooperate with God, sin rebelled against him, that presence could no longer dwell in the whole world, but it dwelt in a place. Right. In the tabernacle at one point in history and in the temple. Yes. And that place represented the cosmic center of God's universe. The yes. earth is supposed to be the cosmic center of God's dealing with humanity, all of the earth. Right. But now that's localized in the temple. Right. And so in a sense, in the Jewish mind, the whole world, the whole the whole cosmos was contained and held within the temple. That's right. The temple was the world. That's right. It was the idealized world. Yes. And so if it fell, it would be the end of the world. It would be the end of the world as they knew it. Yeah. That's exactly right. Which is what we said apocalyptic literature does. That's exactly yes. right. And <laughs> just to lean into that a little bit, it's like this is related to the way that Jesus is a new temple and Jesus is a new sacrifice. The temple was the world as it was the center of their world. Yeah. And in the center of their world was the blood of animals where atonement was offered to humanity and God's presence spread out and blessing and all good things came from there. Mm -hmm. When Jesus dies as a sacrifice and rises to his throne and becomes our new temple, what happens to the old center of the universe? Mm. 
it, it, ha- it has uh, to pass away. It has to pass away. Yeah. And so for a whole generation of Christians who were raised in the temple. Oh my goodness. It would be so cataclysmic of a shift. Right. You, you, and then for a whole group, a whole religion that aren't, don't believe mm. in Jesus the Messiah. Right. This represents the shattering of their whole world. Well, yeah, because everybody used temples. Right, yeah. It's yeah like, not just Jews yes. used temples. Everybody got to gods through temples. Yes. Yeah. And what's amazing, I've never thought about this side of things now, actually. is it's like, And so now, when the Revelator, when John goes into this, you know, supernatural place where Jesus is, he's showing us around the new temple. Like, we're going to see pictures. Oh, yes. And that's he's right. Like, he's like... I know you're worried that the earthly temple's gone. Let me give you a tour of the new, eternal, unbreakable, yes. heavenly temple that you now get to access God in. The very first thing John the Revelator describes the churches as are lampstands oh in a goodness. new temple. Right. Because the new temple is no longer, if, is not will not be a physical place, but all of God's people throughout the cosmos. Right. right? Like, yeah, because inside of Israel's temple was... Lampstands. A lampstand. Right. With little lamps. With little lights in it. And he's like, you are now those little lights on the lampstand in God's temple. That's right. Oh, my gosh. So that's why it deserves a space. And then what? how does the, the book end? It ends where there is no temple. Right. But the people of God are described as if they were a temple. Yes. Um, yeah. So And Jesus is the light. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the reason it's why good. I think reading the book of Revelation in view of the destruction of the temple is partly because of all this significance yeah. <laughs> it's like the, that's baked into this. There is a new center of the universe, and that deserves... Yeah, and if you're talking about like apocalypses bring hope. Yes. And if you're, the center of your universe is being destroyed, you need hope. And yeah. the hope that it offers is there's a new eternal temple in Jesus. Yes. And that's why the book of Revelation is good news. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for Smoking Gospel. That's, really, that's, <laughs> that's great. Okay, what else do we need to touch on today? Um, well, we promised. We promised the 666. We, I think the other thing people come come to the book of Revelation and ask is like, well, what do you do with all the weird images? Okay, yeah. you've given me a whole bunch of great categories. Yeah. You've given me things. But what do you do with the images in particular? And what do you do with the numbers? So many numbers. Uh, even more specifically. Yeah. Uh, and Be, so I th- yeah, Especially because for us, numbers do feel so specific. Uh, right. That's exactly yeah. right. So I wanted to give a couple examples from Revelation 13. Do it. Uh, so in Revelation 13, we get an image of a beast. Okay. Yep. So in Revelation like chapter... Like a beauty in the beast? Li- just like that. Okay. There's this... In chapter 12, there's this uh, dragon that is hunting a woman. Yes. And this dragon loses this battle with the woman. It's cast to the earth. And once it's cast to the earth, it calls up out of the sea a beast. And this is what the beast looks like. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and ten diamonds on its horns and blasphemous names on its head. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it... um, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. And then one of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but the mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. I don't know why we're even making podcasts. That's so... Uh, what? <laughs> it's so, so, it's so, so clear. Yeah. So we, we said that when you come across an image that you don't understand, the first place you should go is... Old Testament. Back to the Old Testament. And almost all of these images are straight from the book of Daniel. Okay. So the book of Daniel... Descri- remember those, that four-parted statue yep. that represented four kingdoms? Well, Daniel has a dream later where there's four animals mm-hmm. who represent mm-hmm. four kingdoms that will one day overthrow the Babylonian Empire. Right. Right? All of those animals he described as successive kingdoms are now combined into one animal. Right? Oh, yes. They're one beast yep. rising out of the sea. So Daniel has taught us to read beasts as successive kingdoms. Mm-hmm. So what does it mean when all the animals are combined as one? It could mean that there it's a more powerful kingdom or the kingdom to end all kingdoms, but like it represents a real national political threat right. to the people of God. Yep. That's what it represents. So I think that's really just helpful to say out loud. Right. And so the other question is why is it rising out of the sea? Uh-huh. Because it's going to come from overseas. No. <laughs> I, know that, I mean, but like to, to lean it, to right. make yeah. your point. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's like you don't just go like, okay, if it came from the sea, it has to come from overseas. It's right. Like, no. What, what's the Old Testament teach us about the sea? What What's the Hebrew understanding of the, the sea? F- the, the, the first thing I think about when I think about the sea, this is probably just me, that there was a sea in the temple. 
Oh, yeah, that's a, not what I thought of. There's first. a giant basin Bowl. of water, yeah, of course, um, in in there, and it was upheld by twelve oxen. Oh, right, which yeah, is an interesting, interesting image. And I think what it's supposed to represent is that the twelve tribes of Israel are upholding the known world, particularly the Gentile world, mm -hmm. and the sea represents the Gentile nations, right? The rest of the world, and they, as a people, are supposed to represent the ways of God to the world. So every time they walk into the temple, they see a representation of who they're meant to be to the entire world. Mm. They're meant to be a people who uphold the world by following God's wisdom and his commands and showing them a nation built around God's presence and his justice, yeah, right? right? One way to understand that yep. image. Um, and so if a beast is coming out of a sea... Yeah, and, if a nation uh, is coming out of the Gentiles... Uh, yep, yeah, is a, that means... Yeah. Well, so I think the idea here is that it's going to be not a Jewish nation is going right. to rise to power, yep. but a foreign nation right. is going to rise to power. And a particularly powerful foreign nation yeah. is going to rise to power and persecute the people of God. Right. So you so there's that Yeah. as a way to read this. So, there are other images the sea connote. The, yeah. the, uh, there's connotations of the sea that are other than Gentiles. Yeah, what are the numbers doing there? Uh, yeah, you don't have to interpret all of them, but what are they? Okay, if the beasts, if the animals are trying to make me think about Daniel, mm -hmm. to to let me know, like there is it, this is a this is just a nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get that. Yeah, the sea, you know, it, uh, that's another symbol, a visual symbol that but the could, Old Testament tells us is reference to Gentiles. Okay, cool. Um, what are the numbers doing? So the numbers kind of you should go back and read the Old Testament, and these numbers frequently appear in the Old Testament. Seven obviously begins in the first pages of the Bible. Mm -hmm. There's seven days of creation. And throughout the Bible, they generally represent either um, completeness, like the whole world is completed in seven days. Right. And so it kind of carries this connotation of just completeness, but it also carries kind of the connotation of creative power. Oh, sure. So if something has um, seven heads. It's very powerful. It's a very powerful thing that's, Inaug could potentially have the ability to inaugurate a, a new, new world. age, a new world, right? Right, like the like Jesus, like God did in, in seven That's days. Right. Yeah. Uh, the number ten is significant for a similar reason. There are ten commandments, and while right, like oh, like so, and it's holding a new law. It's a holding a new law. It's also another. It's a round number signifying completeness. Mm -hmm. We're also told in the book of Daniel that heads specifically represent different leaders. As well. So, so it's like maybe they have multiple governors over this nation or that's something. That's right. right. So it's like yeah. we have a whole bunch of reasons why, looking back at the book of Daniel, to say, okay, this is probably some super powerful foreign power that has a succession of world, a succession of leaders within it that will particularly harm the people of God. Okay. Right? Yep. And that that's, makes sense. And so, and so I, I give this example not to say that's determinative. That's the only way to read right. this. Right. No, no, no. Not the point. But an example of the way we should be approaching the book of Revelation on its own terms. Full of Old Testament imagery. What do they say? Yep. That might be what's going on right, right here. Equally, you could have gone like, oh, the sea represents the chaos that existed at the beginning of the world. That's right. And God, in seven days, created the the, the orderly world out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have the chaos of the world and all its upheavals, and you have a, a new thing with seven heads going to create a new world order out of it. Yeah. Yes. Same yeah. idea is going to come out. Right. Like but the Bible's because the Bible's using its own images throughout, it's going right. to all speak to each other. So. And yeah, so the, what we're demonstrating here is go back yes. and read the symbols That's from the, the Old point. Testament to do this. Uh, secondly, then, let's go to... I think we made our point there. We made our point. 666. 666. Let's go. Uh, yeah. Whew. Woo! Um, so after that first beast that mm -hmm. representing some foreign power, a second beast rises up. Dope. Uh it had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Oh, I know how they I know how they talk. I've read The Hobbit. Uh it's just, think about They like this. riddles. They like riddles. Uh <laughs> it exercises it. all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. So just to even think about this, we have a force that seems like a god seven days of creation we have this beast uh -huh. rising by the chaotic waters uh -huh. with the power to create a new thing it has a mortal wound like jesus did mm. that was healed and he's resurrected from his mortal wound and now you have another beast talking and telling everybody to worship 
this false Christ figure. Oh, interesting. And we yeah. just before this, I told you that a dragon fell and yep. called this thing up out of the earth. So you have a false demonic dragon father, a wounded, beastly son, son, and then an, an abominable Holy Spirit telling people to follow this oh, so thing. This is like an anti-trinity. An anti-dark oh, trinity. Oh, gosh. And that's actually super important as All we right. keep going. So we have a dark trinity being formed right here. I'm so nervous. Uh, an infernal trinity. Um, uh, it performs great signs, um, even making fire come down from heaven and to earth in front of people. This is what the second beast does. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who could, would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell until he has the mark. That is the name of the beast of the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who understands calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Okay. There it is. There's like a whole, like, 666, I think, is like in the title of so many horror movies. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. So, we set up a category. We have a false trinity here. Yep. We have a dragon, probably representing the infernal father, Satan, giving his power to some Gentile force. And some then big nations. Right. And yep. then you have this religious figure mm -hmm. who's ga gathering people to worship, trying to convince the world to worship okay. this beast. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, and this is a dark trinity, a false trinity. And the way you pledge allegiance to this false trinity is by getting um, a mark on your hand or a mark on your forehead. Okay. And you have the number 666 associated with it. So, question should be, where in the Old Testament do we see hands and foreheads? And where in the Old Testament do we see 666? Right. I like this question. Uh, <laughs> and the place that we see symbols on hands and foreheads as a demonstration of allegiance is Deuteronomy 6. Yeah. It's when God's people, Israel, is told to worship the one true God. Mm -hmm. And they're given what's what Hebrew people call the Shema. Hero right. Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this is the de declaration of all citizens of Israel. Mm -hmm. If you want to buy or sell in Israel, if you're a free man or a slave man, what are all the language he's using right here? Right. This is how you be an, a member of the nation of Israel. Functioning member of Israel must say the Shema. Yep. They must pledge allegiance and they should mark it on their forehead and they should mark it on their hands. Yeah, it's like, write it on your foreheads. Put it That's on the right. doors of your houses. Right. Put it everywhere. So what is this infernal trinity demanding of the world? To put a different pledge. That's on, right. I don't think yeah. this is a literal... My, tattoo. My point is, it's not a tattoo. <laughs> right. It's not a RFID chip. Right. Why? Because we've been told by the Old Testament that something that marks your allegiance to a world to the god mm -hmm. to god mm -hmm. is the um proclamation of a statement Here, which is <clears throat> who do you love who do you love yeah and throughout israel's history i think I, i'm not i forget which jewish tradition does this but i think it was all the rabbis no no, no this is I'm, I'm gonna rewind okay in the uh the priest garment mm -hmm. they wear something called phylacteries right and they tie something around their forehead, yep. and they tie something around their hand, and, and it, it contains copies of the, the law. Right. Co topi copies of the Torah. Yes. Copies of how to live in God's kingdom. Yes. And that's how they function. Right. That's and how now, these are, this is an anti-phylactery. That's right. That's right. It's, an it's not a new prescription drug. Uh, <laughs> <side effects. laughs> uh, an anti-phylactery, an anti-shema. <laughs> yes. Meant to prove your allegiance to the beast. Yes. And Which so it's like giving your love, your allegiance. That's right. To this nation. That's right. To a different power. That's right. To something other than God. Yeah. So cool. again, this is kind of proving the same point that we right. talked about before we're getting into the weeds. What about the number 666? Oh, yeah. Uh well, where in the Old Testament do we see the number 666? So, I, yeah, I don't yeah, I don't I don't I don't know. Okay, well, what's fascinating, I've given you all this I've I've been pl I've been playing you. You've this been whole playing time. me. Oh. I've given you this image of an infernal trinity. I've introduced to you this infernal priest figure who's garnering worship and demanding people worship this this beast. Right? Yeah. Um, the 
place where 666 comes. I've, I, oh, I've also loaded your mind with the phylacteries the priests would wear with yes, copies of the law, right? I still don't know where you're going. The first place where, no, maybe not the first place, but I think it's the first place 666 is mentioned is right after Solomon dedicates the temple. Really? Yeah. Solomon dedicates the temple, and we get this hint that all is not right in Israel. We're told very specifically in the book of Deuteronomy that kings are not meant to amass much gold and wealth. Oh, man. And right after the... Not cons- to become some kind of super beastly empire. Right. Oh, and man. And then we're told right after that that Solomon amasses 666 talents of gold per year. And this is the wage. This is the revenue of a ungodly king. Mm. Um, so, and the, what's fascinating here then is that in, we would expect the second beast, right? Yeah. Reading it to be some like imperial cult, something that demands allegiance to the beast, yeah. right? And it's part of the beast empire. But I'm wondering if this image actually makes us think that this actually might be Christians, believers, the Jew, Jewish people, right? Well, demanding, working in cahoots with a foreign power. Yeah, it sounds like the temple, right? That's exactly. Oh, right. is that where you were going? Yeah. It's oh, like, it sounds like the temple as it stands, right? Because just after it was built, and yeah. then it be, and then it wedded itself with evil nations, yeah, to increase its own wealth, yeah, and so it needed, you know, and so it it needed to pass away, and now it's happening again, right? And you have the second temple wetting itself with Rome yep. in order to line its own pockets and it's going to be destroyed. Yeah. Ah, oh, dang it. So uh, That's so, amazing. Uh, <laughs> so I hope this, for you, our audience, I hope this gives you a picture of how we want to approach the book of Revelation yeah. is we want to we want to prioritize Old Testament references right. to help us understand what's going on, particularly in the time period leading up to the, tr- the, the temple's destruction. Mm-hmm. What was happening during, in the lead up to the temple's destruction was the temple was, massively it was hugely wealthy like there was a lot of money rolling through jerusalem mm-hmm. we already know the priest of jesus's day were murderous mm. right we know that they, they were they paid somebody off to jesus himself called murder. them people who drink the blood of the prophets oh, goodness and throughout the yeah. book of revelation we get an image of somebody drinking the blood of people who have died uh, of christians who have died yeah so like this so as you follow us through the next several episodes, yeah. this is how we want, we, how we think we should approach the Book of Revelation, and how yeah. we would invite everybody to. It's That's like, good. and then uh, yeah, yeah. I have two concluding thoughts. Yes, one is, I hope what this does for everybody listening and watching is, because uh, I didn't, I didn't know the six 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 connection, right? But given that framework of hey, if you just told me, hey David, go find out in the in the Old Testament where it says six six six, since you're confused on what it means. I could easily Google 666 in the Old Testament and find it. Yes, that's right. Like, what I like about this approach, other than it obviously being the way that John's expecting us to read his book, uh, yeah. is that it's easier and more reliable than the way I typically see people trying to translate 666 or interpret the symbols. Yeah. Because it's just like, it just seems to be circumstantial and and it, it seems to be that the person with the best imagination or uh, who's read the most news right ends up getting on the bestseller list yeah 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 yeah. and it's like this is just read your bible and you anybody can do this it it, it takes a it just takes a little extra work to just know your old testament but anybody can do this yeah so i just i hope i know i kind of i don't know i kind of feel like i was like oh man i kind of feel dumb for not knowing the answer to the 666 question uh, so I don't. Uh, maybe other people are like, "How did he do that?" It's right. like, I mean, he studied. I, I yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> but there's nothing mystical about it. Is what I, no. I just want to say is like, this is revelation. Yeah, it's 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 making something obvious, and so if it's hard and it's mystical, something's wrong. Right, and I think keeping in mind the fact that this is written to people suffering. Yeah. Under, I think Roman oppression, but also Jewish persecution. Right. And so as a Jewish audience, like this is a, written to a Jewish audience, mm. 407 uh, <laughs> Old Testament, Old Testament illusions. This is written to a Jewish audience yeah. who are being persecuted by their own people more than like are very well aware of the way in which the temple has been corrupted and mm-hmm. the way that it's complicit with powers that hurt them as Jewish followers of the true Messiah. Right. Right. And so, and they're stuck wondering like my own brothers, like my sons of Abraham with yeah. me, do not see me. 
does God see me? Yeah. And what does the number 666 communicate to somebody like that? No, no, no. God sees you very, very clearly. Mm. He knows that the current temple establishment is repeating the sins of Solomon. And what happened to Solomon's temple? It was destroyed. Yeah. And this temple will be destroyed too. Evil will be banished. There's a better temple in heaven waiting for you. Yeah. Uh, like That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That kind of leads into my second question. If, if there's anything else you want to expound on. Why is, we, and we really looked at the first three verses. Right, <laughs> right. But why is this this revelation of Jesus Christ about the things that are soon to take place? Why is that good news? Uh, like, we're spoken gospel after all. Yeah. Why is um, the, why, why, you can even go meta, since we're going to get in the weeds in the future episodes. Why is the book of Revelation good news? And we've said a few things. Right. But is there anything else you could add? Yeah. Uh, I'll go, I'll. Next week, we'll talk about major themes yeah. moving through the book of Revelation. The first one we'll talk about is this theme of conquering. Mm. Um, the Re book of Revelation is good news because it tells us that the worst our enemies can do to us is kill us. Mm. And the idea here is that the empires of the world are beastly. They are ghastly. They are enormous. They will kill us. But... Mm. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we will too. Our temple is not built of stones. It exists in the heavenlies. And when we march towards our deaths, we rule with Christ over all the powers of the world. Mm -hmm. Jesus is sitting on a throne watching all this beastly stuff happen. And he's, oh, and you will sit next to him. Yeah. Alongside him, him making his new kingdom come. Yeah. Like, I, I, yeah, there, yeah, there's no. a whole bunch going well, on. I mean, but... I mean, the simple way to say what you're saying is because Jesus died and rose, we will too. Yes. Like, we will win with Jesus. Yes. No matter the beastly forces, we that's will right. win with, with him. Well, that's awesome. I am so excited for the rest of the series. I hope you guys will continue to join us as we walk through the book of Revelation, looking at some of its main themes, uh, the seven bowls, the seven trumpets, the new heavens, the new earth. We have a lot of fun stuff to talk about over the next several episodes. So thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel creates short films, devotionals, and podcasts like this one. Everything we make is free because of generous supporters like you. To see our resources, visit SpokenGospel.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. See you next time.